Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Recording by Artist P, it would have to be Work M. Well, Artist P is the violinist Nathan Milstein, and Work P is the Bach Sonatas and Partitas for solo violin. It was a Milstein specialty. Let's talk about Milstein, first of all. Nathan Milstein was one of the great, 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 greats of violin playing in the 20th century. He was a class act. He was one of the last students of the legendary Russian pedagogue Leopold Auer, who also taught Heifetz and other people like that. He was part of that Russian violin school. His first violin teacher was the same as David Oistrach's. His initial playing partner was Vladimir Horowitz when he had his career. I mean, he was just in the middle of it. He studied with Eugene Isai, you know, sort of, kind of. He was everybody who was famous. I mean, his, his, his pedigree was second to none. He had an amazingly fluent technique, but that's not what he was known for. He was known for musical intelligence, class, insight, he was kind of like a, a Russian Arthur Grumio, let's put it that way. Um, he had a beautiful, beautiful tone um, and scrupulous taste and refinement. Really an amazing artist. He was most closely associated, in addition to the Bach sonatas and partitas, which he recorded twice. These are his Deutsche Grammophone recordings. His first recordings were on EMI slash Warner, um, but he was also... He was also known for playing the Tchaikovsky Concerto, which I saw him do maybe five times over the years without any diminished capacity. He played into his 80s. He only stopped when he broke his hand, and that ended his career, and then he died a few years later. So he was, he was an amazing artist, an absolutely amazing artist, and he doesn't get quite the attention that his colleagues got. Like Oistra, who was stayed in Russia, and Heifetz, of course, who had the contract with RCA. Milstein actually did some recordings for RCA, but it, most, of, most of his work was done for EMI at the time. And then at the end of his life, he made a few recordings for a Deutsche Grammophon. Unfortunately, unfortunately, he desperately needs a serious, beautiful box from EMI. Deutsche Grammophon did a box, but it's only the Bach stuff, the... Um, what he did, he did the Brahms Concerto, and he did the Mendelssohn and the Tchaikovsky with Claudio Abbado. That's his DG legacy, essentially. But there's tons of stuff on EMI, and it needs to be carefully remastered. A lot of it's mono, but most of it is just fabulous. He was he was astonishingly great. His Beethoven Concerto was gorgeous. His, his He did a beautiful Dvorak Concerto at a time when very few people were playing the Dvorak Concerto. But Bach is sort of what he's best known for. Now, I have to say, since the period instrument movement and all this other stuff has happened, these Bach performances, which were the reference recordings, I mean, they were. I mean, they were regarded as such for many, many years, have slightly fallen by the wayside, not because there's anything wrong with them or anyone else is better, but just because every violinist in the universe now does these things. And as a matter of course, just sort of tosses them off. When when Milstein was doing these, they were very much specialty repertoire. And to be associated with them was, you know, as big a deal as it was that, for example, Pablo Casals doing the Bach cello suites. Now, every cellist does them. There's billions of recordings of them, but these were really special. I mean, these recordings were made, what, 1970, 73, it looks like, 75, something like that. 75, I think, is what this says. You can't see the damn things. As usual, let's use the uh, magnifying glass. Up, oh, 75, yeah. So that was a big deal. I got my first copy of these from the International Pervert Society. So we used to call it as a joke, the International Preview Society, a record club that licensed all this stuff. And I have to say, I was not prepared for what I heard because I was not a big Bach fan, and I certainly didn't like music for solo violin. I thought to myself, how can anybody listen to just something for a solo violin and nothing else? 
I mean, nothing else. And there are fugues here, four of the three of them, fugues written for one violin that's supposed to play multiple voices, which is very peculiar. And th these things are, let's see, it's, it's two hours and something of music. I mean, that's a lot of music for just one violin. And I started playing it and I gave up after like five minutes and I tried again and I gave up after another five minutes. It's really, I, you know, I've always said, everybody just sits back and says, ah, oh, Bach, Bach is just so Bachian. and he's such a, a Bach a thing. He's, he's, a, he's a Bach and owl. He's, he's a, Bach is not an easy composer. I, I absolutely insist on that. Whether you love him or don't love him, his music is difficult. Everyone said that about Bach in his own lifetime. And so I'm not saying anything new. And these pieces are some of the toughest of all because they require great focus and concentration. Yes, you could play them as background music. You could ignore them, you know, and just you know, do your gardening while you listen to them. But if you really want to pay attention, you have to take them in small doses and, you know, one work at a time, max, and, and give them plenty of opportunities to sink in. You also have to like double stops, which I always thought sounded horrible. Double stops are when you play more than one note on the violin. In this case, you've got triple stops and quadruple stops, which have to be sort of arpeggiated because you can't play them all at once in one bow stroke. You have to sort of break the chords. But I always thought double stops sounded like you were doing something mean to the instrument. You know, that, you know, you have two or three notes all sounding at once on a violin. Very difficult. They sound lovely here. They certainly do. But the, of course, the great bit of this is the chacon from the D minor partita. Just so you know, the difference between a sonata and a partita is that a, a sonata has no dance music. A partita is a suite of dances. And the sonata usually begins with a slow movement and then has a fugue, something contrapuntal, and then another slow movement, and then a quick finale. But they're not usually dance movements. Um, that's why they were suitable for performance in sacred buildings, in the church. The church sonata was one type of those things, was a sonata beginning with a slow movement. And, you know, some of Haydn's symphonies are in church sonata form. They go slow, fast, minuet fast, or something like that. These don't even have minuets most of the time. They're just, they're just slow, fast, slow, fast. And the second movement is a fugue. In the partitas, you get the usual dances, Allemande, Courant, Saraband, Gigue. Those are the standard ones. And you get other things. And in the second one, the D minor partita, you get the great Chacon, Chiacona in Italian. Or it's the same thing as a Passacaglia, in case you know what that is. Simply a series of variations over a ground bass. A ground bass means a you know, bottom line pattern, pattern of notes. In this case, dom, bom, da, da, da. No, that's Shostakovich's which is 15th. It's quite similar to this, actually. Anyway, the bottom line is that this is Bach's, Bach's largest instrumental piece. It's, it's 15 to 20 minutes long, depending on the performance. This one's about 15 and a bit, which I another thing I love about it. It has impulse. It has rhythm. It has energy because it is a dance after all, but it's a deeply intense, magnificent piece of music. And it shows you that in Baroque music too, big does not mean huge orchestras. Huge orchestras didn't exist. Big is a function of the type of music that the composer is writing. And this Chacon is the ultimate in this kind of piece. Um, it's extraordinary. And the fact that it's written for a solo violin, just a solo violin, is an incredible tour de force because once you get into it, you realize that it is as vast a piece of music as anybody ever wrote for this limited number, this limited force. And that's one of the reasons why these are such extraordinary pieces and all the violinists in the universe play them um, because they are amazing, absolutely amazing, amazing works, feats of, of imaginative daring on the part of Bach. And they basically, like everything Bach wrote, summarize just about everything you could do with a solo violin at this period in violinistic history. And these performances are just uncompromisingly great. They really are. And they've held up very, very well over the past 50 years or so. 
um, extraordinary, extraordinary music played by an extraordinary violinist. And I would give this to the evil god Kangrazans and say, listen to this over and over and then make sure you let us hear the rest of what this amazing man could do, including his first series on EMI of this music, which some people actually prefer. Um, and that's, that's fair one way or another, but they're, they're equally great. They really are. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.